Hey, welcome to worship. Welcome to worship. Welcome to worship. Good morning and welcome to worship for Sunday, September 13th. Rally Sunday, God's Work Our Hands Sunday. And this is also the Sunday we traditionally really kick off our whole program year. Boy, this is going to be a different year. But one thing remains the same. Every year, at the beginning of the year, we fulfill our promise to our children, made at their baptisms, that we will put the scriptures in their hands. So let me show you a few of the options. When they're baptized, now we give out the Frolic Bible. It's a very cute board book, all the good stories. Our first graders get the Spark Story Bible. Easy to read, all the fun stories. Our third graders, very grown up, get the Spark Bible. It is actually the same NRSV Bible you would read, any adult would read. It's written with some more pictures and some extra explanations. Our confirmation students get a study Bible called Collaborate. So let's talk about our Bibles. We want them open and we want them used. I would call this a sad Bible. It's a sad Bible because it's clear it hasn't been opened up. It's very stiff and none of the pages have any notes. This is the kind of Bible I like. I like a Bible that's got sticky notes in it, that's been highlighted with favorite verses because that means you've opened them up, you've read them, and you've made some notes. We call the Bible the living word of God and it's living if you're using it. So welcome to worship. Welcome to your new Bibles, and welcome to a new program year. Good morning. On this day when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, let us prepare our hearts with the order of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O Lord God, merciful judge, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good, 
in order, in order to preserve a numerous people, as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Word of God, word of life. The second reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise the, those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat. For God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. Word of God, word of life. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 18th chapter, beginning with the 21st verse. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In his anger, the Lord handed him over to be tortured until he should pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. That is a pretty scary thing to hear at the end of the parable. And what brought on this story about this forgiven slave who refused to forgive? Well, it was Peter asking that question, how many times am I expected to forgive? And he started out sounding kind of proud of himself. It seems that he was a forgiving person. It sounds like he maybe had forgiven the same person several times. But what do you want? Patience has its limits. And we can imagine someone asking Peter's question in the same practical tenor as that conversation we heard last week, 
practical advice about settling conflicts. But what is the practical limit in forgiving someone who offends over and over again? And Jesus says, well, not seven times, but 77. Or maybe your Bible says 70 times seven. I remember in the 1970s, in the days of the Jesus people, people were wearing um, a button that said 70 times seven. It was intended as a conversation starter. And when people would ask what it meant, then you could, you could explain how Jesus taught about forgiveness. Now, of course, you ran quite a risk in wearing one of these things. What if someone listened to your spiel and then they decided they would test it and be kind of irritating on as, as possible uh, to see if they could get your goat? Especially your family members going, ah, 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 remember what you said. And there's also a basic risk that when you wore your 70, 70 times 7 forgiveness button that anybody who knew you very well would realize that you really couldn't keep that promise. And I believe that Jesus was saying these things to Peter and to the rest of us, knowing full well that we would, all would fall short, we all would fail. And he told the parable to expand on this expectation of forgiveness. Now, can you imagine a slave being in control of 10,000 talents? It couldn't possibly be realistic. That would be something like a national budget. Jesus is throwing out the most outlandish examples that he can think of, to make his point of the wideness of God's mercy and then the pettiness that our human nature can sink to. And the king at first sounds so cruel, doesn't he? To be ready to, to sell the slave and all his family and all that he has? Well, he was perfectly within his rights. That is an assumption in a slave economy. People have done that in our own country. Even today, our legal system and courts provide us some pretty forceful way of collecting what's due to us. But the king was entitled to be especially cruel here. But all he had to hear was the plea for mercy. Just give me more time and I'll make it right. And not only does he adjust the terms uh, in a merciful way, he cancels the entire debt. And you would think that that would move the servant to be merciful himself. But no, he goes after it's not just another debtor, but a fellow slave, someone that he ought to have understood, someone whose helplessness that he might have experienced. Some of the cruelest people can be people who rose out of poverty or rose out of some bad situation, then they forget who they are and they look down on those who are still struggling. Usually those people who made out so well did it with initiative, but also with a hand up from someone else. And it's really kind of a trifling sum. One comparison is, think of his own debt of maybe $10 million versus about $20. It, we're talking about the days when people had to subsist on about our equivalent of 20 cents a day. It's trifling. But grievances take on a life of their own. We can turn things over in our minds until it's hard to put them into proportion. I know I have trouble dismissing something offensive that was said to me once quite a long time ago. Well, at the time, it was important enough to that other person uh, to have bothered to say it. But I suspect that other person has long ago forgotten all about it. But it was important to me, so I can't guess what that other person still might think. This is also known as giving free rent to people to take up space in your head. And I am positive that I have not been given my own suite in that other person's head. As many times as I've read Jesus' parable about this forgiven slave who refused to forgive, I've never really noticed that phrase that when his former friend couldn't pay the small debt, he seized him by the throat. The New International Version says, he grabbed him and began to choke him. We hear more and more about black men in this country being grabbed by the throat, usually for some kind of infraction, but something fairly trivial that shouldn't have escalated to choking the other that person. Now, you and I might be far removed from a situation like that, but Jesus saw that human nature, when a person feels wronged over something trivial, human nature can whip us up, at least in our heads, to really wishing that person ill, to just do away with them. And when that person falls down and pleads, whether they're literally choking, we hear people saying, I can't breathe, might not be 
our situation, but whether literally choking or just saying, I'm in a helpless situation, give me a chance to make things right. We can forget that we would all want mercy if, if we were to ask. And we can rest in the assurance that we are forgiven people. The king decided to, to punish the slave after all, but whose choice was that? The slave decided that he did not want to live in the manner of his king. He did not want to live by mercy. It wasn't the king's desire to punish him. The slave had made it clear that he had no intention of repenting. And by repenting, I mean he had no intention of changing to a new path as a forgiven person. That's cheap grace. And cheap grace is bad for everyone involved. When Marie Fortune, she's one of the pioneers in the study of the relationship between the church and domestic or sexual violence, when Marie Fortune uh, was asked to work with people in prison who had committed the, some of the most extreme crimes, she found out something interesting. She discovered that every single one of them at some point, it had a, early on, it had a clergy person hear their confession and very quickly offer absolution without any regard to whether the person really understood the enormity of what they had done or if they were taking concrete steps to stop. So in the end, there were more victims and the offender in the end would get life in prison. Another fresh insight about this story for me comes from Pastor Terry Kylo. He's from Paths to Understanding. It's a ministry devoted to bringing Christians and Muslims and Jews together. And Terry was responding to the book White Too Long by Robert P. Jones. It's a book about the cheap grace in confessing racial sins to God and then not making any amends. And Pastor Kylo says, and I hadn't heard this before, in Muslim and Jewish traditions, you cannot ask God for forgiveness for something you did to someone else. And he said that would be like one of his daughters hurting the other and then apologizing to him instead of to the sister. And earlier in Matthew, Jesus said, if you've offended your neighbor, don't even bring your gift to the altar. Don't bring it to God until you've made peace with your neighbor. Part of addiction recovery too is making a searching and fearless inventory of yourself asking both your higher power and the people you've hurt and being willing to make amends. Sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes that's not wanted, but we should be willing. The story ends then on that scary note. In his anger, the Lord, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he should pay his entire debt. So my heavenly father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Remember, he said this to Peter, the man who kicked off the whole discussion by revealing that he basically didn't get it. He really didn't understand what forgiveness was about. And Jesus knew that we would get it wrong often. Maybe these fantastical examples in the story, a slave in charge of many millions of dollars, maybe those fantastical examples are a clue that he's talking about a world of, about forgiveness beyond what's humanly achievable. We are always running the race that's set before us. We come to the end of the story and we see at least how we look to God when we behave like the man in the story. But in the same way that the king was entitled to sell the slave and his wife and children, but didn't, God would be entitled to treat us harshly, but chooses to be merciful. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin. Amen. One bread, one body, one Lord of all. One cup of blessing which we bless, and we We are one body.
Now let's pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Good and gracious God, we pray today not as we ought, but as we are able. Teach us to forgive and teach us gently. Let us be bold to name sin and to do whatever you call us to do against injustice. We want to be doers of your will and not hearers only, not to silently judge when we should act. Let us also let go of offenses against ourselves. Let us be re reconcilers. We pray this day for people in the path of fires, people who have lost their homes. We remember before you people in California, people in Eastern Washington, the Sumner Bonnie Lake area. Make us better stewards of your earth. We pray also for our nation, for the city of Seattle and all cities in need of healing, justice and peace in the streets. For our political process, for our president, our Congress, the Postal Service, the courts and for our voters. Make us a nation of thoughtful and conscientious people. We pray also for everyone affected by the pandemic, for those who are sick or mourning loved ones. Help us find ways to break through the isolation. Bless and keep safe healthcare workers and researchers. Let them not lose heart, but be able to care for themselves as they care for us. We pray for financial relief for those without jobs, safety for those who bring us the goods and services we need, safe shelter and hope for homeless people, a love of learning and ways for students and teachers to accomplish it. Give us all the patience we need to watch our own habits and keep ourselves and our neighbors safe. We pray especially these days for those whose lives are closely linked with ours we lift up to your care, Mona, Cannon, Dorothy, Kathy, and Sandy, and those we name to you now. Bless Pastor Deanna in her new ministry and Keith as he continues to serve students and teachers. For all of us carrying on our ministry as we go through changes. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, your plans, and your love through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his friends, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, This, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the, for the remembrance of me. We pray now using the words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God, the body of Christ broken for us all. The blood of Christ shed for us all. Now go in peace, remembering that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts daily with thanksgiving. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thanks be to God.